nitpicks. And Alan talking about movies. They may be best friends, but they always disagree. Nitpicks. And Alan, I seen that. I believe this is our 11th episode together. Hell yeah. And uh, you definitely have the record for guests. Taylor's got about 100 on you. But, yeah, um, but he's not really a guest. I, I consider him a guest. <laughs> <laughs> he's always been a guest to me. I, I don't want to <laughs> take any more credit than that. That seems about... We're learning more and more about this podcast hierarchy every day. <laughs> That's what happens when you have the record button. You get to dictate a lot more. I'd love to try and organize a time when all of us can go on. Yeah, that would be super complicated. Cause, uh, yeah, time zones are a thing. It is, let's see, what time is it for you right now? Because it's 9.30 p.m. for me. It's 2 p.m. for you? It's 2 p.m., yeah. And I think it's uh, 7 a.m. for him right now. Well, if he woke up early, it'd be easy. Yeah, if it wasn't so lazy. Easy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's his problem. I, That's why actually, it's always going to be a guest in your eyes. <laughs> yep. I actually think he gets up pretty early, but he has. To, that's because he has to get to work by like six o'clock in the morning. So he's probably already oh, been wow. working for an hour. Oh, he's, no. He's a lot less lazy than the both of us, apparently. I mean, this is my job. <laughs> Coming on my podcast. <laughs> Coming on your podcast is how I make my living. So I put food on the table. <laughs> um. But today, we are going to talk about Jim and Andy. Indeed. Which is funny because we, me and Taylor actually have already done an episode on this, uh, but that won't come out for a long time. So we'll just make all the good points and then Taylor, when he makes them later on, they'll just be much less powerful. I have been studying this film for the last week, so I'm very, very... <laughs> Locked on onto everything that happens in this film because the the newest nitpicks, the tenth nitpicks video is going to be on Jim and Andy to some degree. So, had you seen Man on the Moon before? Uh, you Jim and Andy came out before that was on your radar. No, I actually hadn't. Okay, um, but then I went and watched it as soon as I finished the documentary. Okay, so you saw the documentary first and then the movie. But I've, I'm a huge, like, Andy Kaufman fan. Okay. Yeah, well, I mean, Max was, and then Ma Max, like, kept trying to force him on me. Yeah. And then eventually it worked. <laughs> and now I know, and now I've been, because, basically, the video I'm going to upload is going to be called um, Jim Carrey is an Asshole Method Actor, and it's going to be the longest nitpicks video ever, <laughs> and um, it's, it's, it's going to be pretty thorough. And the opening five minutes is just on Andy Kaufman. So all of yesterday, I basically spent 12 hours just like downloading Andy Kaufman footage and watching loads of Andy Kaufman videos. So this was, this was a question I had. Do you find the original Andy Kaufman stuff funny? Yeah, very much so. Do you very, very, very much so. Did you find it funny in Man in the Moon when Jim Carrey recreated it? Yeah, okay. I did. Okay, because for me, I, I I don't find it funny in Man in the Moon. It like it's good, it's well done, but it I don't know if it's with the backstory and just the narrative of the whole movie that's much more serious. That when he does it, there's something more tragic behind all of it. Do you know what I mean? I don't find it as funny. Yeah. Um, and that's down to Jim Carrey's performance to a certain degree. Yeah. Um, but um, it still it still has moments where I find it funny. Yeah. Like the Elvis thing I found funny. But that was like, I mean, I'd seen, I'd seen Man on the Moon and then after that i think it's a great gateway into andy kaufman if not, someone hasn't heard of andy kaufman or doesn't know who he is if they watch man on the moon they will be able to watch andy kaufman's material with context mm. because i think if you watch andy kaufman's material without context sometimes you can be a little bit like alienated by it yeah well that's i mean that was his his goal too like yeah he was hoping that's how he felt <laughs> a lot of the times 
Well, he wasn't. He wasn't even a comedian. He was a performance artist. Yeah, and um, I love all his characters like so much. Mm. <laughs> like my my favorite though is his wrestling character. His wrestling character cracks me up so much. Like all of yesterday, I was just watching Andy Kaufman's like like um uh like promo tapes he made <laughs> that aired on TV, like local network TV. Uh, there's one bit where like he he says he says to um Lola he says he says oh I've wrestled women just the same size as you even bigger than you and he goes like look at this woman and he just brings on this obese woman and he goes like how f- how much do you weigh and she's like three hundred and twenty seven pounds and he's like watch this Lola this is what I'm gonna do to you and then he just grabs her and like like pins her down like really aggressively and starts like pulling her hair and it's just really like horrible to watch <laughs> and then and then um Bob Zamuda who's pretending to be like a, a an agent or PR guy or something just like grabs tries to pull him off and like shuts the camera off that guy he's and so just, he's so intense when yeah. his commitment that yeah. it's impressive and also concerning well the 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 thing is, is like to be honest, like the idea of um, fame and the idea of being liked and the idea of um, of of having like this really happy, like likable character that people want to see on TV. Uh-huh. Like Andy Kaufman was sort of aware of how much of an illusion it was, yeah, and how you didn't really need to have that in order to be appreciated. And uh, the funny thing is, is Andy Kaufman was like this huge wrestling fan um, from a young age. And obviously, like he knew it was all fake. Yeah. Like, he could tell it was all fake. But this was before wrestling, like admitted that it was all fake. And he was like, he was he was watching it and he was like, these are people who are playing characters of themselves where they're trying to be as disgusting as possible, as unlikable as possible. Yet people still like enjoy them. Yeah. People still watch them and and find them interesting. And then he said, like, I want to do that for comedy. Like I want I want people to believe that I am this person. And I want people to hate me. <laughs> So he actually tried to get into the actual WWE, but they wouldn't let him because they they would wor- they were worried that everyone would fig- find out that it was fake. So that was like thirty years before they admitted it was fake. But that was what happened with Lawler was he wanted to become like an actual wrestler, like <laughs> on TV, but they wouldn't let him. So he just did it on his own with Lawler. Yeah. Um, but the, yeah, I mean, the I, psychology behind wrestling is fascinating to me um, because everyone, I mean, everyone now knows it's fake. And growing up, that was always kind of, I don't know how much exposure you had to it as a kid and stuff, but not literally zero. When I grew up, that was when like The Rock and Stone Cold Steve Austin and all these guys were like really popular. Um, but it was well known that it was fake. And people would like hate on people for liking it and be like, oh, why would you watch something like that? It's it's all fake. It's all scripted. But it's all just a basic hero's journey story, right? Like it's everything comes down to you have your hero who is just trying to overcome adversity. And there's not there's not a lot that's different between, you know, like some – a movie like the 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 storylines like the they're written a lot better in movies and they're given a lot more time to like figure it out but at the base of it it's it's a it's a soap opera with it's basic storytelling Yeah, yeah yeah it's basic storytelling um i i really do feel like south park was like a key part of them coming out with it being fake um did you see the south park wrestling episode i did not Oh, you you have to see. It's so funny because they turn it into this really theatrical thing. So they they like really work on their characters loads and and um they have all these like redneck hicks 
go and watch wrestling as if it's going to the theater to see an opera <laughs> and you've got like people from the wrestling like community like standing standing like in these um in these boxes like with these binoculars and tuxedos on mm. and just going like he's a fantastic wrestler and it's just like long monologues <laughs> about like his life <laughs> and it's um i think it's like sweet because it it is such a it's such a new and like crazy art form mm -hmm. that that so so many people have clocked on to like how how interesting as a as a way of telling stories it is i mean um well it's also uh, long form storytelling too which is yeah because you have it it's week to week and so you can build you know like this long arc over six months of one guy getting beat down and trying to overcome, getting beat down, trying to overcome, getting beat down, trying to overcome. And finally you get that like moment of satisfaction when he finally overcomes. And it's not, it's not for me, it's not really fun to watch. It's kind of, I don't know. It's kind of goofy and like, it's impressive what they do, but it's like so contrived, but so ex over the top for you. Yeah. But it, like, yeah. Yeah, the, I, I totally understand why people like it. I totally get why people get invested into it and enjoy it. Um, one of the, the interesting things, the, one of the reasons why it did come out as fake is Vince McMahon, the owner, he, uh, so for the longest time they were putting out like, no, this is real. This is all real. Like these guys are actually doing this. Nothing staged, nothing scripted. And the commissions the guys who set up the boxing fights and like give the licenses for all that were like, all right, any, any combat sports is going to need to go through the commissions and pay taxes and all this stuff. And Vince McMahon was like, Nope, we're fake guys. This is scripted sports <laughs> entertainment <laughs> and just totally gave up on that idea. Once it was going to start costing them money. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was a good business choice. Yeah. I think since they've come out, that it's all fake. It's only gotten better. Yeah. Oh um, yeah. I'd love to see more sports like become scripted. Just every like, sport like scripted curling. Yeah, I mean American football or like basketball, but like it's like <laughs> like it's like a soap opera. That would be great. Um but yeah, um Jim and Andy is a documentary. I really I think it's really good. Yes. Um, the editing's really clever. Yep. Um and I really like the soundtrack and the 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 main thing about it is just is just they kind of by interviewing Carrie by putting in a modern day interview with Carrie they've kind of made it seem as if they're on Carrie's side yeah and like they think what Carrie's done was great when really if it had more of an objective like observational like kind of this is what happened yeah it's up to you to decide whether what he was doing was okay or not I think it would have it would be more interesting. And Jim Carrey's there's a lot of questionable things they put in the final film. Yeah. Like Jim Carrey talking about his like view on psychology as just like it's so like vapid and it's so yes. like superficial that it kind of just is like the, you can't I like was watching this. I was like, "There's no way that they they thought, oh yeah, Jim Carrey's really, really mind blowing us now when he's talking about free will." It's like the things that like a college student would say. It's not even. There's <laughs> no, nothing even nuanced or intelligent about anything he's saying. It's just like, did I pick up the water, or did my bro did it was that my free will, or am I just doing it because I'm thirsty? Like, was I always meant to pick up the water? It's like, shut up. You're like, shut up. The, um, yeah, I think the documentary is great. I think it is really hard to make a documentary about someone who is so frustrating and the documentary <laughs> not feel frustrating. Like, it's so, like, I finished it and I was like, I don't know how I feel about that. It was well done. The story is fascinating. Everything Jim Carrey did was so interesting and how invested he was into it. But he was so annoying and so frustrating to watch and so obnoxious that it made me uncomfortable to go through it, especially when it came to the uh, Jerry Lawler stuff. That was like almost upsetting. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. I'm really glad that you've said that because basically this this video I'm working on, we have no idea how well it's going to do. We have no idea if anyone cares. Um, we're also a bit wary that Jim Carrey fans might be the most intense fan base we'll ever have to deal with. Mm. Just because I, I can imagine anyone who blindly loves Jim Carrey is just going to going to shit all over us. <laughs> <laughs> so... um. So, so it's interesting that you've had the same response that sort of we had, and um, why we felt like we should make this video, because though the documentary's good, like we believe that Jim Carrey was not not like doing his job very well, and we also believe that um, he needs to be called out on it. So that's why we're sort of making this video. Yeah, but, but, but we have no idea if anyone will care. Um, this is like we put the most this is gonna, the most amount of effort it took us four days to write we've gone for extensive rewrites um it took it took a day to record with loads of different takes and stuff so we we've really put like everything into this video so i'm i'm really happy that you have taken sort of a similar a similar like kind of reaction to jim and andy that we had well that means to preference more <laughs> I'm not really a Jim Carrey fan. He yeah. he grates on me like any like I saw um comedians in the car getting coffee, the Jim Carrey episode. I don't know if you watched that. No, I didn't. And uh, it, he was just it kind of exhausting. He like I, mostly I just kind of feel bad because he's always performing for the camera. Every every moment is a chance for him to perform and be on and it just like i know it was a show right like so yeah that makes sense but it, it felt it came across as like oh no that's just his life every every chance he has to perform that's what he's gonna do and it just feels so kind of sad i like jim carrey um in movies uh, i don't like jim carrey outside of movies i like um, jim carrey in about half of his movies his serious movies, I'm yeah, assuming. Mostly. Truman Show. Truman Show is good. Sunshine. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I, I like him when he's being goofy. Like, I think The Mask is great. And I feel like any other actor in The Mask, like, you, it could have worked if maybe you cast an unknown, but, like, there's no actor in my mind that could play The Mask, like, on the same level as Jim Carrey. Will Smith. Um, <laughs> don't talk to me about will smith the fun funniest thing in my bright review like i've got two comments now like really offended that i called will smith a relic of the 90s <laughs> well that's offensive like, really angry like really really angry it's because you're not american he's american america's sweetheart is he ah uh, he was everyone loved yeah him. he was in the 90s that's why he's a relic <laughs> of the 90s yeah well yeah he some some guy went dude have some respect <laughs> like, <laughs> you do you respect will smith you do need to watch bad boys that yeah, i haven't seen it that will give you a better i think that's a good one bad boys is pretty I, good. I don't think will smith is a bad actor necessarily well, i just think he, he, he it's needs an interesting director it's an interesting idea because it was a, a debate Taylor and I had also about um, oh, what's the guy's name? He's in uh, the Thor Ragnarok and he's in the original Jurassic Park. Um, why can't I remember his name? He's in Samuel the Jackson. No, uh, the white guy. Oh my oh, goodness! Oh, Jeff Goldblum. Yeah, Jeff Goldblum. Thank you. That was awful. Uh, he kind of plays the same character. Like he, he, his, his essence is always shining through more than his character. And uh Yeah, and Tom Hanks does that too. I yeah. mean loads of actors do that and that's fine. Like that's completely fine. Will uh, Smith just always picks bad <clears throat> movies. Well not always, but most of like ninety percent of all the films he's in are terrible. And then he's cast in films where that personality where he only plays himself doesn't work. Like Suicide Squad. Yeah. Like him playing just standard Will Smith doesn't work in that film. And also in Bright, like I really think if you had got any other actor to play him, that character would have been better. Will Smith like is going around saying, Oh, no one likes me. 
It's just like Will Smith, you're the most charismatic man like in the world. <laughs> like you can't you can't be smiling and making jokes and one liners and be like, No one likes me. Shut up. <laughs> anyway, I, back to Jim Carrey, I feel. <laughs> I feel we should well, stay on top. <laughs> yeah. Jim Carrey kind of has a similar thing to that too, though. To I where I disagree. You do you? I think he yeah. other than his his like Eternal Sunshine is uh, very different, but Truman uh, Show is very different. Truman Show, he definitely Man on the feels moon, he's like a different person. Like, he, it's like he was controlled by someone else. Like his his body was taken over by someone else's spirit. Oh, uh, here we go. Right, we're gonna go <laughs> right into this then. Okay. Um, no, that Jim Carrey was not possessed by Andy Kaufman <laughs> at all. That's not what happened. Jim Carrey seems to like want to try and keep saying this, and yeah. it's a way of avoiding responsibility. Yeah. See, he went around that set shouting at loads of people, being an asshole to this Academy Award like winning director yeah. who's like really good at what he does, and he's just being abusive to him, aggressive to him. Uh, then he's he's getting drunk, needing to be carried into makeup, and he's just he's just yelling, disrupting everyone. There's a bit in there where um, he turns into Tony Clifton, and you can hear this woman yell, "No, no, we don't want Tony to come back." <laughs> Yeah. Like they're not finding it funny. Like they aren't being they aren't enjoying Tony Clifton. They they really aren't. And then and when he's in character as Andy Kaufman, he's there like talking to people about Jim Carrey. That was annoying. That drove yeah, me he's crazy. Like, he's like Jim Carrey, a bad thing happened to him, and rather than heal, uh he'd rather be broken because he's worried if he heals he won't be as creative. It's like shut up! No one cares. <laughs> no one cares. That's the equivalent of going going to your job and like talking to people like at work on a normal day about like about like your life Is about that, everything you've gone through. That's not because he's doing a he's doing a job. Like he's doing he's he's working. Like yeah. you, no one wants to hear about like his him being broken and needing to fix his creativity. And obviously, it's just all all ego and all attention seeking. Like he wants people to be thinking about Jim Carrey, and he wants, to some degree, his idol Andy Kaufman to like to think that he's on the same level. Which yeah. is where I think this has all come from. Well, I wish they um, would have interviewed for the documentary. I wish they would have interviewed Danny DeVito. Because I wish they would have interviewed anyone on that set, but I'm glad they didn't because. Because basically, like, Danny DeVito was a producer on that film. Yeah. Like, Danny DeVito, like, was there from the beginning. There's literally, he can't say anything negative about the filming process of that because he's a producer on it. Yeah. And, like, even though it was, like, how, how many years ago now? Like, like 1997? 1999 something I don't know. like that i don't remember yeah i think yeah it was 1999 it's even though it was 19 years ago he still needs to protect that because he still is a producer on that but you but, can just tell from the footage you can just tell exactly what danny devito thinks yeah well he's a producer on that film so he has to go along with jim carrey but it's so half-hearted like he's so he's like yeah yeah man like he's just like yeah like he's just got no energy like he's clearly not enjoying it yeah well because i why i would, would like to hear his side of it his honest side without you know being cagey or whatever is because he was in taxi yeah, exactly. And, and he Andy was a, Kaufman not, hated being in Taxi and never, never disrupted the set on Taxi. Not once. There's, <laughs> there's literally no stories of Andy Kaufman disrupting the set. The only thing he did was got in Tony Clifton. like, And that was just because he wanted to leave Taxi. Yeah. And I found out something quite shocking as well mm. that I would like to share with you. Okay. Um, you know Bob Zamula? Yes. Okay. Like are personally? You ready for this? No, no, no. But I'm, you ready I've for never this? met him. Yes, I'm ready. Tony Clifton is not an Andy Kaufman character. Andy Kaufman has never played Tony Clifton. Tony Clifton is entirely Bob Zamuda. 
The joke is, every time Tony Clifton says, I'm not Andy Kaufman, he really isn't Andy Kaufman. And every time Andy Kaufman says, I have nothing to do with Tony Clifton, he ha- literally does have nothing to do with Tony Clifton. Yeah. He's, he's, they are not the same person and they never have been the same person, not even once. Mm. How funny is that? <laughs> That everyone credits Tony Clifton as an Andy Kaufman character. Even I'm going to do it in my video. Yeah. Well, how how do you know that he never he never did? I thought they did stuff together. Where... No, that that that's what they want you to think. Yeah. There is absolutely no footage anywhere. Believe me, because I spent yesterday like hours searching for a single picture of Tony Clifton as Andy Kaufman. And it's always Bob Zamuda. Because hmm. you can tell, because Bob Zamuda has a certain chin that Andy yeah. Kaufman doesn't have. And it's never, it is never, ever Andy Kaufman. Tony Clifton, have you seen him in anything? Like, I'm sure well, I'm, you probably have. You've seen him in a lot of stuff right now. But uh, yeah. I hate that character so much. And I know that's the point. That is he, the point. It's, it, it I, I, I don't know. How do you feel about things? that are purposely annoying or grating or... Okay, so Tony Clifton had a Las Vegas show. Yeah. Where he would sing, (laughs) and first I was afraid, I was petrified (laughs) really badly. (laughs) Couldn't have to think you by my side. And um, then, then he puts on a cowboy hat and he says, this is the comedy part of the show. Uh Uh-huh. And it's just the fact that he's wearing a co- cowboy hat. Like, that's the only joke. And it's not even a joke. <laughs> and then he makes carrot juice for 10 minutes. <laughs> he makes carrot juice and says it's good for his health. Like, as part of his Las Vegas show, he stands there and makes carrot juice. And he doesn't even speak. He just makes carrot juice. So, like, Tony Clifton is hilarious. Um I mean, if you've paid to see a good show, then it's probably not hilarious, but it's funny. It's, <laughs> it's funny just as as like an idea of a character. I mean, do you know, have you heard of Steve Coogan? Yes. Why? So Steve Coogan, it? Steve Coogan in the UK has loads of characters. Um, there's um, Alan Partridge. I don't think I know who he is. Okay, I think so I'm Steve Coogan, he's a UK, he's a UK actor, but he's been in a few like Hollywood stuff. Um, like he's in, he's in, um, what's it called? Uh, the the film, uh, the the film directed by the same people who did uh, Little Miss Sunshine about the girl Ruby Sparks. He's in that. Okay, yeah, I know who he is. Yeah, yeah. So he's got loads of characters. He's got one called um, Steve uh, Alan Partridge, which is his most famous one, and he's just a really crap DJ. So he's just like he's just really unfunny and yeah. like cringy. Uh-huh. And like this is this is like kind of the thing. It's like kind of cringe comedy. Like he's Andy Kaufman is like the beginning of cringe comedy in America. Yeah. Um. So you've got like <clears throat> you've got like characters from The Office as well who are like cringe comedy. And uh, yeah, I, 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 Tony Clifton's really funny on stage as a performer, but and also doing pranks with people. Yeah, but I think I think he's set funny working with him. He's he's not someone you want to be on set working with. He's just he's not funny. He's just really aggressive, and like frankly, like violating in places. Yeah, I think he works better on paper. I think recapping what he did. Is much funnier. Like, watch, um, like watch you... Tony Clifton on David Letterman. It's it's really funny. Yeah, it's really 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 funny. Um, it's just things he says. Like he says that he he says that he knows Frank Sinatra personally, and that he's a very private man and stuff like that. <laughs> he it, it's it's funny. It's really funny. Trust me. Um, it's just not fun. It's funny as a performance. It's not funny as something you have to deal with every single day. Yeah. Well, I kind of have a, a similar thing about Andy Kaufman. To exactly. Where exactly. It's funnier in a recap. It's funnier, like to say, "Oh, Andy Kaufman read The Great Gatsby to you know a, a stadium full of people or a, a auditorium full of people." That that sentence 
is a funny idea, but to sit however many hours it would have taken to read The Great Gatsby, that would be miserable. But the the joke the joke isn't funny unless he does all of it. He has to no, read I, all of it. Otherwise, no, it's not I, funny. No, I know. it's. Um, but that that's what I mean. The, like, to experience it would not be enjoyable, but to get no, it but recap. That's, that's why it's funny. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a complicated thing. I mean, it it's just this idea of breaking boundaries um be, and because that's that's not entertaining but the the reason why it's funny is because Andy Kaufman says oh well this is the greatest like human piece of art like ever produced yeah. like how can you not enjoy this <laughs> like that, and that is funny <laughs> <laughs> because like yeah sure you can't like how because you're sitting in the chair for hours listening to andy kaufman do a fake english accent reading it <laughs> um and there's a bit he does uh there's a bit he does at the improvisational uh theater thing called um eating ice cream mm. and it's six minutes and it's just him ordering ordering ice cream in a makeup restaurant and eating ice cream that's the entire bit and it is really funny um but the the thing is is what i think jim carrey didn't quite understand yeah that andy kaufman is a performer yeah and you know though okay so someone like um i can't think of like someone like richard pryor yes like richard pryor is a funny guy mm -hmm. but if you're like, oh yeah, for the next like four to six weeks, every day on set, I'm going to be Richard Pryor. But like, I'm not going to be a low key Richard Pryor. I'm going to be Richard Pryor on stage in front of an audience for four to six weeks. Yeah. And I'm going to be yelling jokes at you, whether you want to hear them or not. That is going to get annoying. Um, the thing is with method acting is method acting, like anyway, it's kind of, it kind of like, it doesn't really work that much. It is more of a thing an actor does for attention, yeah. generally speaking. Mm -hmm. um, but like, it can work sometimes. Like Robert De Niro, obviously, like has has been able to use method acting. Uh, you know, and and Daniel Day Lewis has been able to use method acting. But you never hear about them them like <laughs> screaming on set in character and like abusing people like what you normally hear about robert de niro is a certain actor goes like oh yeah like robert de niro is a method actor and my character's like an antagonistic character to him so like we just didn't talk on set yeah and that's as far as it goes it's like he was polite to me but he didn't really want to talk to me like that that's as far as it went when he was yeah when he was um in in taxi driver the character that he beats up in the campaign office. The actor who played him said that Robert De Niro was really friendly to him, but like didn't want to talk to him. So yeah. that was it. Like, yeah. When you and when you hear about like crappy, like bad, like method Suicide. acting, you think of Jared Leto. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and compared to what Jared Leto did, compared with what Jim Carrey did, yeah. like Jim Carrey was actually worse. Yeah, maybe. It, like, it's hard to say definitively that he was worse because you don't you don't have a documentary of what Jared Leto did the entire time. But uh, seeing all the behind the scenes stuff of Jim Carrey, it was it kind of ruined or tainted uh, Man on the Moon for me because I I really yeah. enjoyed Man on the Moon. Then I watched Jim and Andy, and then I watched Man on the Moon again right afterwards. And uh, yeah. I definitely uh, did not enjoy Man on the Moon as much. It, it was like, oh, this is this uh, the the impressiveness of Jim Carrey becoming Andy Kaufman is so so ruined because he was a bad version of Andy Kaufman. He was this this like uh, tropey version of Andy Kaufman, not actually, you know. He didn't actually become him. He became this persona that was put out of him and not who he actually was. Like, uh, yeah. The I mean, he could have method acted as Andy Kaufman like quite easily, mm -hmm. like without, without like being intrusive to anyone. Yeah. Because he could have just been quiet and humble, which is what he was like when he was being interviewed. I mean, if you see Andy Kaufman be interviewed by um, Orson Welles or 
you know, if you see him on Letterman, like he's really, he's been on Letterman a few times and every time he's on Letterman, he's very quiet yeah, and very like kind. And I mean, when he was Andy Kaufman, he was a bit, he was like that uh, to some degree, but like it, it was just like weird because, you know, you've got a few things, you've got him, him talking about himself as Andy Kaufman, you've got him, him like um having an in character argument in the makeup room um with the actor who's playing his dad yeah that was and <laughs> they played it off like that actor just came in and started yelling at jim carrey but i have to believe jim carrey told him to do that right like that actor i don't believe that i don't believe that i think what it is is that actor cuz they played one clip of that actor yeah like being in character with him uh huh and Jim Carrey, like, walks away. He's like, oh, I don't know what to say. He goes all, like, shy and walks away. Yeah. And I think that was something that he really enjoyed. I think that was something he really liked. And he thought, I want more of that. The um, which act, the, the, the actor dad. who's playing the dad. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. he's a C-list actor, you know. <laughs> he wants to be on the same level as Jim Carrey. Yeah. So he comes in and he does this, like, this crap. And, like... It's such an on the nose, like badly performed <laughs> improvisation <laughs> sequence. And there's two things about that that I love. Uh huh. One, the makeup artist starts crying. Yeah. Uh, which is just, which is a point in the video I'm going to make about like the vapidity of like, of like Hollywood and how like everyone's just quite self absorbed. Yeah. And like just wants to make it about them. And then Paul Giamonti, do, <laughs> you have to rewatch this scene. Where he's like Look almost giggling, Paul right? Paul Giamonti, no, no. Oh. Paul Giamonti has his hand on his head and he looks completely done with it. He looks so done with it. If you see in the documentary, Paul Giamonti never engages with Jim Carrey in character yeah. at all. Yeah. He never, He never does it, not once. He, one bit he goes like, you don't smoke. Like, and that's it. Yeah. And th that's him talking to Jim Carrey, not Andy Kaufman. Yeah. He's going, what are you doing? You don't smoke. Like, he's clearly, like, not comfortable. And Paul Giamonti's a great actor. Yeah. And so is Danny DeVito. Both of them have done, like, their fair share of, like, their movies. And it's just clearly, like, not, <laughs> not something they approve of. Well, it, it's, it, it's really, really bad. Like it, there's no, there's no excuse for any of it. The, I think the, his interactions with Jerry Lawler really highlights it all because Jerry Lawler is like, at one point says, you know, we were, me and Andy were friends. Like, this isn't how Andy would have treated me at all. Like we had our, our, you know, drama on the stage, you know, like in the ring or on TV or whatever, but we were friends. Like, he wouldn't push me down when I had my back turned to him that could have hurt me or throw eggs from a balcony or do all this stuff. Like, it's just... I don't know if that was Jim Carrey who threw the eggs. It might... I think it might have just been someone. Yeah, maybe. Who, but, I mean, they had... I don't know. They, they had, never show it was Jim Carrey. They, the filmer was up there. So, yeah. it, it was someone I'm, connected with it all. I would assume it was, like... The way I see it is I think Jim Carrey was starting to realize that he was annoying, like, blue-collar workers mm -hmm. on set, like, a lot. Yeah. And Jerry Law Lawler was just something to do. It was something to channel yeah. things into. And the argument for him acting that way is, well, he was just in character as the antagonist wrestler character. Yeah. He wasn't in character as Andy Kaufman. He was in character as this like wrestler who was trying to sue Aunt Jerry Lawler and was just like constantly mocking him. Yeah, because th those were the scenes he needed to do. So mm. that that's that's the argument for that. Um, and then the the idea of Jerry Lawler being like Andy Kaufman's friend. Yeah, uh, is something debatable within the Andy Kaufman fan base. Mm. 
Personally, I believe he was his friend. I believe they did work on it together. There's a really great podcast with Jerry Lawler where he talks about it. And he's like, yeah, um, the promos were actually filmed at my house. Like the Andy Kaufman promos were filmed <laughs> at my house. Um, but And he seems very genuine. Yeah. There, there's, no, there's no real way to prove it. I mean, part of it is after he died, Jerry Lawler was like, yeah, I didn't like him. Mm. So it's like, why would you keep keep it going after he's dead? It yeah. seems a bit strange. But then the the Andy Kaufman fan base um, question whether he's even dead or not, <laughs> which is <laughs> wow, is so upsetting because uh, they feed into it as well. Like I think there's a um, a book that came out that said he's going to kind of like reveal that he's been alive this whole time. At it was either twenty years or twenty five years. Do you know about that? Yeah, yeah, I've looked into it. Um, it's supposed to be like next year. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'll just, I'm just gonna say like we'll see, but like until <laughs> until we see, I don't, I don't think so. I think, <laughs> I think it's definitely it, safe to say that he's dead. Like, I mean, there's there's a bit of evidence around it. Like, there's this idea that um that he was talking to people about like the best way to fake your death and yeah. how to do it. And his brother has said a few times that he's not really dead and then changed his mind and said he is dead. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, yeah. it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Because like whether he's dead or not, like he's not working. So like, you know, if 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 he's turned out that he's faked his death, it will it will be one of the like <laughs> the most amazing cultural <laughs> phenomenons ever <laughs> happens. And I think that's why people want it, would it to be, be true. It'd be so sad if he had faked his death, made it 95% of the way of whatever it is, 20, 25 years, and then died accidentally right before he finally no was going to come out. Yeah, no one knows. <laughs> but like, I would also like to just talk about like Jim Carrey's performance in Man of the Moon. Yeah. Because you'd think with this long, drawn-out method acting thing that this would be like worth it. Yeah. And... His performance is good, but it's not great. It's yeah. not like, it's not like, like I've been checking like lists of best biopic performances <laughs> and Man on the Moon isn't on any of them. Like people, people rate like other performers so much higher than Jim Carrey and Man mm -hmm. on the Moon simply because his version of Andy Kaufman is like, it's, he's got the dialects like perfect, except uh -huh. everything facially and everything expressive wise is the cranked up a notch yeah because if you see andy kaufman he says everything very straight and very to the point and you never know when he's joking and when he's telling the truth and yeah. that's part of the fun with andy kaufman um and you just watch and you're just like i don't know like what what is is he being serious here like the there's this whole thing they do it in the movie but it's so much better like when andy kaufman did it when um he was in that show. <laughs> he was in that show and he just decided they was going to go off script and then they all start fighting. Yeah. Um, and then the apology in real life um, was done a week later. It wasn't done immediately after. It was done a week later. Um, <laughs> he starts to read the statement and then he just says like, he just starts talking about how it's affected him. And how like he hasn't been able to get any work, and how his wife and him are in separation because of that. <laughs> <laughs> and he says like, if they show that clip again, I might never work again. If they show that footage again, I might never work again. And then he's like, everyone's laughing, and he's like, please don't laugh. Like I'm not trying to be funny here. Um, and you watch that, and I'm I still don't know if that was what they knew Andy Kaufman would do. Or whether mm. he just decided to do that, yeah, because it, it's it's so weird. Um, but yeah, Jim, in in the video, I'm gonna do some like exact line by line comparisons to to really prove that Jim Carrey's performance is like turned up a notch. But another point I make in the video is going to be about how his audition tapes are literally exactly the same as what we see in the final film. So his audition tapes he did before. The method acting is oh, exactly yeah. Yeah. as good, even slightly better in places than what we see in the film. So all of it was not important because Jim Carrey could have just 
turned up as Jim Carrey done the scene and gone. <laughs> like it would not have made a difference. Yeah. He and then the idea of him just doing things that Kaufman would have done, I just I just don't buy that Kaufman would have behaved like that on a film he wanted to be a part of. Yeah. Well it was like I was I was thinking about it, I was talking with Taylor about it. Like imagine, you know, someone is acting like you are like doing things that you wouldn't do in your name because they think it's it's funny or whatever. Like it's just it would be so frustrating to see someone just being a jerk and using your name as a reason to get by doing it. Well, it's slightly insensitive. It's slightly insensitive. The whole well, like I've been possessed by a dead person is insensitive. If you want to way. talk about insensitive, we should talk about him meeting Annie Kaufman's daughter. Yeah, that's a huge part of the video as well, yeah. This is what I'm I'm saying is that to some degree he's taking responsibility for for Andy's for giving Andy Kaufman's relatives closure. Yeah. So when it comes to him acting really badly on set, it's like I had no control. It was Andy Kaufman working through me. Yeah. But when it comes to giving people closure, he's very happy to like make it seem like that was all him. Yeah, well it's it was so it, it was so upsetting the just the idea of all of that because i think cuz they show the family a few times and the family's like kind of impressed but i don't think they're impressed for the reasons jim carrey is putting forward like i don't think they thought oh this is andy kaufman brought back to life i think they thought oh this is a nice tribute to andy yeah you know what i mean like yeah, that yeah. that's how it seems like it would actually be like oh like this is this is great. Like he's doing, he's doing such a good thing for Andy. Look at that. And, but Jim Carrey's putting off like they were so thankful that they had yeah, a chance so to be with their son or brother son again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and it's like it's weird because he's he's saying no one knows what Andy Kaufman was like. He's constantly saying, "Oh, no one, no one ever knew the real Andy Kaufman." Yeah. And then, and then he's saying they spoke to their son for the first, like they got to speak to their son again. Yeah, and it's like you're admitting that you don't know Andy Kaufman yet. You're saying that they spoke to their son again. Like that mindset is like, oh, Andy found out his daughter wanted to talk to him. It's like, no, you found out that Andy Kaufman's daughter wanted to talk to you. Yeah, and you were very happy to take some of that that attention it, i think the only thing jim carrey is frustrated about is that no one filmed that interaction yeah or maybe, maybe they did film maybe they did film it and they decided not to show it do you know what i would love to see all the footage of the behind the scenes stuff just released just in like 20 Let's hours see everything. of it. yeah yeah no probably longer than that <laughs> probably like five <laughs> days worth of material like let's see all of it let's just see all of it yeah because i would love to see some more some of the more like shady stuff that they would have cut out yeah. because it's amazing in a documentary that seems to be on jim carrey's side the amount of material that's in this that is like very clearly showing jim carrey being an asshole <laughs> like, well i don't I don't know. I, I struggle with if it is on Jim Carrey's side because I feel like I, I feel like Jim Carrey goes back and forth about it, even in the documentary, to where he almost seems against what he did, but he's also proud of what he did. Like, I don't think he's ever against what he did. No, he, he shows no sign of guilt. No sign of guilt. He could have said, "I'm sorry." Yeah, he never said that he's sorry. There, there's absolutely no guilt in this at all. He is very much proud of himself for what he's done. And in a way, he seems thankful that finally the footage has been released. Finally, people get to see this amazing thing he did. Yeah. Yeah, I um, I don't know. I, there was a few times like, where the he fact ag that they acknowledged that people would see him as a jerk. Like, I think he knows that he was a jerk. But I, I don't think he cares that he was a jerk. He I finds guess. it funny. He finds yeah. it funny. The um at the end, when they're wrapping up the documentary, one of the more uh upsetting lines, not because it's about Jesus, but that he would even even say it, 
as an idea was he's like, I wonder what else I could do. Like, I wonder if I could become Jesus. Like I became Andy and it was just like, Oh my goodness. That's insane. Like he could have anyone, not even Jesus could have just been uh, Tom Hanks or something like just the idea of like, he's so proud of what he did and that that he he could be, he he could could just channel anyone. And it was just like, Oh, like you, you seem to be, missing the point here or something like it's just i don't know he's just he's just basically like the thing is is he he wanted to be taken seriously as an actor he wanted to be taken seriously as a comedian Mm -hmm. he wanted to to have more of a purpose because for in for jim carrey's entire life all he ever did was panda all he ever did was be in these mainstream comedy films that like appealed the masses. He never once like did something original. He never once was like, I'm going to make something myself. I'm gonna wholly mm. make something. He never he never once like sacrificed any of his fame or did anything that would that would lose that fame. He wanted attention. He wanted people's love. He couldn't be further away from Kaufman in that respect. Yeah. Like really, he couldn't be further away from him. And then he he starts looking at Kaufman's work in preparation for this film, and he realizes all his insecurities come out. That like actually like despite him thinking he's a bit like Kaufman, he will never really be anything close to him in terms of what he did artistically because they're just different artistic goals so so he's like if i'm show up on set as kaufman that would be the ultimate kaufman thing to do and then he realizes oh this is gonna be like big everyone's gonna think this is amazing i'm gonna be like i'm gonna win an oscar like i'm gonna be you know seen as this fantastic actor i'm finally gonna get this credit and Everything about the collaborative process of the film goes down the toilet because Jim carries on a different wavelength to everyone on set who wants to make this film good. So they can't think about what shots they want to do. None of the actors are important alongside Carrie. And even Carrie's own takes aren't treated with respect because every time he goes up and does a performance as Tony Clifton, if the director goes if Milos Foreman goes like, oh, actually, can you play it down a bit? He's in character as Tony Clifton, so he's going to say, you don't know what you're talking about. And he's going to have le- he's going to have bad takes that like are going to end up in the film. You know, they're trying to do a sound check, and he's, like, screaming. Oh, yeah. Like, how can, how can you be creative? Like, how can you start to think about, like, what would look great in your film? What's going to really pop out? What's really going to make people engage with this story when you've got to deal with Jim Carrey on set being this way? Yeah. You know, you can't, Milo's foreman is clearly stressed. He's clearly not happy about this arrangement. He phones up Jim Carrey two weeks into the production and asks him to stop he phones him up and goes like, look, I don't know what to do. Like, I haven't dealt with anything like this before. Like, I don't know what to do. Yeah. And Jim Carrey goes, I can do an impression of them, which basically translates to, I can do a worse performance if you try and make me, like, stop doing this. Yeah. He says, we can fire them and I can do an impression of them. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, no, you're doing an impression of them already. Yeah. And, like, to be fair, like, I think Milo's Milo's foreman in some degree, like, thought that this was going to make the performance and the buzz about the film, like, like it was going to help the buzz of the film as well. And I think that's why he didn't just say, like, yeah, do the impression. Because that's what I would have done. I would have said, yeah, do the impression. Because looking at his audition tapes, him doing the impression would have been just as good, except you would have actually been comfortable on set. But then how much of an an idiot would Jim Carrey feel if after two weeks he comes on set acting normally? (laughs) <laughs> that would be that would be rough he, that would, <laughs> yeah yeah i don't know if his fragile e- ego could deal with that well it has what do you what's your opinion of man on the moon after seeing jim and andy has that changed anything for you i like man on the moon i do i really do um and my criticism with it is actually similar to my criticism with jim and andy as a documentary which is <laughs> Andy Kaufman was always trying to 
break boundaries. Uh-huh. Like that was the main thing he was trying to do was to change things and be new and break boundaries. And like, so what if people don't like it? I don't care. And like Man on the Moon opens with the credits and that's like the only time the film tries to be weird and do something different. I wish they would and- have gone longer with that bit too. Yeah, and Jim Jim and Andy is just standard documentary. Yeah. It's it's very well edited, it's nice, it's it's well done. You know, you got you you find out a bit about Jim Carrey, you find out a bit about Andy Kaufman, you know, you question things, the footage is entertaining, it's interesting. You've got Jim Carrey's like like thing going on throughout it. But what about this separates it from a standard documentary you'd see on TV? Nothing. And it's like, if you're doing a documentary in the style of Andy, if you're doing a documentary to some degree about Andy Kaufman, you've got to make that documentary weird or different in some way. And the same with Man on the Moon. It's a standard biopic film. There's nothing weird about it apart from that opening. And my, my thing is, if they had just gone more extreme with it, and just like got to a bit where they're like, oh, actually, this isn't what happened. And then they redid a bit of the biopic, but differently. Uh, have you seen um, Confessions of a... Ugh, it's the George Clooney film, Salesman, Death of a Salesman. Um, the one which is about... Um, it's the one which is about the guy who invented the love, the love, um, the love game. No, I don't think so. Well, yeah, there's a is that is that is a biopic film, but like he basically wrote this <laughs> he wrote this autobiography, um, this guy who invented the love game, you know, the blind date thing, oh, Bachelor okay. Number yeah. One, yeah, yeah, he invented that, and he wrote this whole thing <laughs> about how he was involved with the CIA and how he killed people, yeah. And like you just read it and it's insane and like there's no <laughs> there's no proof that he did any of this. Um, but you kind of wanna believe it. George Clooney turned it into a film and he just was like, All this is let's just do it as if all this is true. <laughs> so it's really weird. Um so like this idea of like actually Andy Kaufman's like history and like what he did isn't really that important. Like you'll just believe anything we show you. Like if they had done that, I would have. That would film. It's risky. It's risky, but like, so what? Well, they also I mean, the 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 time jumping that they do in the movie. Um, they only do scenes that are famous. There's not a lot yeah. of. There's like very like a maybe ten percent of the movie is not a famous scene of Andy's. You know, what I mean? like the majority of it is either on set or on stage. Or you know, like things that have been documented, and they're it's just like all recreated. All of Andy Kaufman's it. best bits redone with Jim Carrey, which yeah. is strange. Yeah, I would, I, I could have quite liked it if it was just like Jim Carrey, like alone in his room, like he's about to die of like cancer, and then it's just the whole film. It's just him <laughs> in his room, like going back. But whatever. Uh, I really like the ending of Man on the Moon, though, with the like, with the like prank, with the hoax. The, I don't know if that really happened, but like I like that having when they go to the cancer court, like healer, and it's all fake. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I really like that. Like I think that's really strong. Yeah, because he just starts laughing, and it's it's great. <clears throat> I hated that crossfade though. I don't know if that actually though. happened. The crossfade. The cross so fade. it goes from him laughing with his eyes open to him dead in the coffin, and something about the crossfade because it's lined up right on top of each other. And uh, it is so creepy looking to me when they do it. Yeah, that's the biggest flaw of the film. Yeah, that's the, <laughs> that's what this, uh, I'm going to title this podcast episode. Because everyone will know exactly what I'm talking about. Man on the moon. Yeah, they go, that, that crossfade. <laughs> I was thinking it. And Alan from I Seen That said it. I Finally, like someone. The, just like the pizza with Iron Man. <laughs> or the tank. Oh man, that pizza! <laughs> how to, that pizza! How to criticize films. That pizza! Don't don't even act like that's that's not the worst looking pizza you've ever seen in your entire life. Oh, uh, it's not even that bad. It's so bad. It doesn't it's make so any sense. It's clearly just a pizza that would be on set. It's so clearly five different pizzas put together in one box. Reuse pizzas. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a cold pizza. I mean, I never, I didn't notice. Oh, that's because um, you you don't know how to 
analyze film. That's the problem. Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> I was too busy being like, oh, this guy's going to be the villain. Oh. <laughs> during that scene <laughs> well you know because he's playing the piano yeah anything no, classical just, no because he's just like he's just like oh I guess he's gonna be the guy who made Iron Man go to the <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> but yeah I mean like even I don't want to like sound cocky or anything because this is definitely going to be what like makes people hate my video yeah and it will definitely be the reason why no one finishes You're it. You're making a biopic on Andy Kaufman starring yourself? No, no, no. The 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 video we're doing is like the weirdest one we've ever done. Yeah. It, it's really strange. There's going to be a two-minute monologue about my grandpa in there. Okay. Um it's 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 going to be strange. It's going to it opens with an with a with a spoof of nerd writer and and then me, me like punching Max because like because like because I told him to stop ripping off Nerdwriter. It's 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 the weirdest video like I've ever made, and it's gonna be really strange. Um, but like we just thought because it's got it's sort of about Andy Kaufman to some degree. Like we've got to, we have to challenge like some degree of boundaries on YouTube just yeah. because like it is Andy Kaufman. Wait, you guys didn't just, go to the Suicide Force, did you? <laughs> no, that's just stupid. Like, but in terms of what you expect to see from a video essay, like yeah. it, it's it's weird and it won't work. People will hate it, but like whatever. There you go. <laughs> so yeah, I just, that's that's just really my opinion on Man on the Moon, and I to some degree, like I I I feel bad calling Jim Carrey out on being an asshole method actor because when I finished watching Man on the Moon my thought was oh no one else could have done this other yeah. than Jim Carrey mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that was that was what hit my that was what was on my mind and I know I'm gonna get that commented a whole load I know people are gonna say like oh who would you have as like Andy Kaufman well, Jim Carrey the point is is like is despite a... how good he might have been for the role like acting that way on set is not something you should promote in any way and i really hope that like young actors do not watch man on the moon like jim and andy and be like oh wow that's so cool i'm gonna start doing that because that's how you get fired the <laughs> yeah um jim carrey is probably the perfect choice but yeah he intentionally made his performance worse by what he did like he the everything he did uh, outside of the filming made it a worse performance. And yeah. he like, not that he didn't take it serious. Cause I think that it, that, that level of method acting is taking it serious, but if he would have taken it more professional, it could have been, I think a lot better. You know, if he would have listened to more, like it's hard cause you don't know exactly what happened, but based on the documentary, it doesn't seem like he would have taken any type of criticism or uh, constructive criticism or they, advice. They, or play, they, they play one, there's one clip in the documentary where there's a, there's two where he's talking to Milos. One where Milos is just trying to like uh, confirm with Jim Carrey that he's coming over for dinner. Yeah. Yeah, that and, was. <laughs> and, and, he, he goes, and he goes like, oh, well, you've got to talk to Jim about that. Yeah. And he's like, oh, well, like, he's like, come on, man. Like, are you coming or not? Like, he's just so done with it. Yeah. And he's like, he's like, well, you got to talk to Jim Carrey about that. And then he just goes like, okay, fine, fine, fine. And then, and then he goes like, oh, you know, man, I'm just so exhausted. And then it cuts away. Yeah. Uh, and then the second time is him literally giving Tony Clifton like f direction and he's going, okay, okay. And he just screams really loudly at him. Yeah. And uh, that's the only time they see him interacting with Milos. And like also Milos is trying to get Jim Carrey to stop antagonize Jerry Lawler. But there's never a positive clip of the two of them. No, and well, even with, there were so many people because they had almost the entire cast of Taxi on the set. Yeah. Which yeah. is probably has the most depth yeah, Christopher of experience. Christopher Lloyd was in Man on the Moon, but I don't know if he was he was actually acting in it or if they just used the clip. 
I, I think they did both. I think they cut in stuff, and I think they all had the actors on set. It's such like a shame because the script is really good. Like the script is really good. Yeah. Danny DeVito is a fantastic producer. Like I really, I think he's a great producer. He knows exactly the right people to get involved mm -hmm. with the film. And it seems like Jim Carrey really did taint it a bit. Um, were you around when it came out? Because obviously I was like free. Yeah. Were so you around it, when it came out. 99. Is that what it was? 98? Yeah. 99. I would have been about 10, 10, 11. Yeah. Uh, I, I saw it, it on VHS well the first time. Uh, I feel like it wasn't that that greatly received. I feel like it was, uh, it kind of, I like it kind of came in under the radar. I could be wrong, but it also could be because I was a kid that I was more aware of his comedic roles, like Ace Ventura was and Dumb and Dumber. even and nominated like for an Oscar? I don't know. I don't I doubt it. I don't think so. Let me see. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just not quite, good enough and, that's, and it's it's fun and it's a nice film but like so it it won it, two golden globes um and it got 22 different nominations but that was it yeah um, and i mean like compared to other biopics it just isn't as good um and it really could have been um but it wasn't and i feel jim carrey's to blame partly for that but well, then, I also think the source material is really tough if you're not already a fan of Andy Kaufman. Like, I think it. I think this movie is a good way to build fans, but it's not like if you watch it without knowing who Andy Kaufman is, you're like kind of intrigued and you're like, oh, what what was that all about? But like, you would remember. But. I remember when I was really into Jim Carrey when I was younger uh -huh. and I was like looking at all his films and I saw a trailer for Man on the Moon <laughs> and the trailer literally because of Taxi, they only use clips of Jim Carrey as the foreign man. Yes. So I watched it and I was like, I hadn't obviously, I'm a little British boy. I've never seen Taxi <laughs> or heard of it. Well, so Taxi was, like, was even... 20 years before all of that i believe so i was like who is this like i was like who why is jim carrey doing this annoying voice and i never watched it <laughs> um let's see so i i think maybe the trailers were bad so he was coming off of the truman show and that's kind of the big one going into man on the moon uh, liar, liar, cable guy, Ace Ventura. He, he was Batman nominated forever. for Truman Show, I think. I think so. Uh, Mask, when was he in Batman Dumb Forever? Dumb. Was that after this? It was before. Oh, for God's sake. Like, he's 95. Not... And this whole, like, this whole, like, pop psychology, popcorn psychology, like, um, woke Jim Carrey is really annoying. Yes. It's well, really, really, really annoying because he's just going about and being like, nothing means anything. And there's a part of the documentary. He's like, yeah, I was in this fancy restaurant and I stood outside loads of paparazzi and I just stood there for ages. And they were like, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm not doing anything. What about you? And he like seems to think that's like really amazing. Yeah. But like really it's just kind of like, it's kind of just like, actually you're, like, you're just like, like, you like if you really wanted to do something interesting or funny, you could have just like you could have just like like done something a little bit less passive than stand there for ten yeah. minutes. <laughs> but like, I think he's he just sort of realized that like fame and fortune doesn't give you anything, yeah. and it's vapid and meaningless. And like because of that, he's just kind of like, uh, and his girlfriend died as well. So I think he's just kind of like he's just kind of like realized that everything he's been doing to get fame and fortune and success has been like pointless and that he's just wasted his entire life. Yeah. Well, that was a big driving force. Even in the documentary, they talked about it, about him signing a $10 million check to himself. Like that yeah. was his ambition was I'm going to make this amount of money. And then he did it. And then he's like, Oh, uh, that didn't fix everything. 
Because like his stand-up comedy as well isn't really that good. No, well, <laughs> like, he... he wasn't really a great comedian. He and like the annoying thing as well is that he's like, I saw a fortune teller and she said there were going to be three big things happen to me, and it's like that's like the, the worst fortune telling trick in the. That's like the most common fortune telling like trick in a book. But like, I can promise you, Alan, that three big things will happen to you this year. Oh wow. Like, I can I, promise you that. Do you know what they are? No. N- neither did this fortune teller woman. <laughs> no, with Jim Carrey. She just said three big things are going to happen to him. And he was in three big movies. But, like, it could have been anything. Like, could have been it could have been any three things. Well, people find <laughs> meaning to anything. Mm. You know, they'll, like, he, he could have never gotten a movie, but still had three meaningful things happen to him. And connect you could have that had to three that. TV performances, like, and been like, wow, or three it's, good it's, conversations, or three good sandwiches, or you know what? Like, it could really be almost anything. Like, if nothing happened to him, he still would have at least three things that he could point to. That like, oh, that must have been he said what she's three talking big about. Things. He that said would... three big things, and then he corrected it to three big movies. But I really doubt she said three big movies. No. Yeah. Well, I think he said it was three things that are going to make him solid that people won't be able to shake him off of. So, like, yeah. giving him security and stuff. But. So, I don't think this woman was really seeing his future. I don't think but so. But, like, Jim Carrey's just the sort of person to believe that and take that on board. And, yeah, I mean, Jim and Andy is a good, is a good doc, but, like, is a good doco, but Jim Carrey's just... <laughs> just very very obnoxious all yeah. the way through it yeah and it and it's a shame because i actually did quite like him before i saw it and now i'm making a video exposing him <laughs> um well how can people find out about your video where can they find it well uh if you search jim carrey as an asshole method actor it'll be the first one that comes up but it's right. under nitpicks so just search an n-i-t-p-i-x and you can you can have a look at my channel over there. You, you you think you're the first one to make that video? Yeah. And did you look? Because I'm gonna I'm gonna post one right now. You're gonna post one now, <laughs> don't how dare you? I'm gonna take that. Don't steal my thunder, there. Alan. <laughs> uh, I'm taking you in this. You're in you're you're in the inner circle here. You just can't Oh man. But uh yeah, if you guys want to get a hold of us, you can tweet us at I seen that pod. <laughs>